I don't want this view because video may probably not that. So, very good morning, uh, mm. friends. Uh, thank you, Suven, uh, for uh, making me part of this course. I have seen Suven grow from you know a colleague to a, a giant in the field of cataract and refractive surgery. So, it's I really feel proud to be part of his courses. Uh, since uh, David Campbell, D David Chang, and Campbell defined or published IFIS way back in 2005 life has become much simpler for us. And earlier on, or maybe a couple of years after that, till the realization dawned on us that there is an entity called IFIS. We, I used to have a lot of patients where, you know, as soon as you enter the eye, there is a tsunami going on, so much of fluidics, there is a savage iris prolapse. And till I realized what is going on uh, and rectified the matter, took remedial measures, last 10 or 12 years, I don't have any such uh, violent uh, cases. Uh, which are very dramatic uh, looking. So I'll be showing you a video of a patient who was an IFIS uh, candidate, an elderly man with alpha-1 ear antagonist, a hypertensive guy, benzodiazepines. And if you see the pupil, uh, the pupil also doesn't dilate. This is the maximal midriasis. Uh, literature has mentioned that any pupil which, is, uh, which does not dilate beyond 6.5, 7 or 8 millimeters could be considered as an IFIS candidate. But then it is not very easy to measure the pupil uh, diameter. So what I do is I take the pupil limbal ratio, the, you know, the limbal uh, diameter and the maximum dilated pupil diameter ratio. If it is less than 60%, uh, then I consider this patient as an IFIS, even if the patient is not on those classical medications. So let us see how uh, the case goes. Uh, so we took him up under topical anesthesia. A temporal uh, clear corneal incision was planned. So inferior paracentesis is all right. You know, I mean, it is a full uh, with the 20 gauge MVR blade. Uh, we have to ensure that the incision, the corneal incision, should be long. They should be, should, they should not be borderline. The superior paracentesis is small because that is the, the site where we are manipulating the instruments, and you know there will be fluid egress. And we, if it is a floppy ID situation, we don't want people to be prolapsing out. I injected xylocard in this particular patient, but subsequently I have realized that you have those cocktails available with combination of uh, tropicamide, phenylephrine, and, uh, and, xyloc and xylocaine. You know, so those do extremely well. Uh, in this particular case, it was only xylocard, one person that was injected inside the patient's eye. Uh, be uh, very, very careful when you push your blade uh, through the clear corneal, temporal clear corneal. You, as I mentioned, it has to be long. Now, when I stain the anterior capsule with tripen blue dye, I realize that pupil is coming down. And I am really on my guard, on my toes, and need to take all precautions. So use a soft shell technique. It is very important to use a good quality uh, dispersive agent uh, inside the eye. So some amount of you know, viscomidrasis happened in this patient. So I was sure that I'll get an adequate rexis. So even if I have a pupil uh, coming down during the course of the surgery, if my rexis is uh, 5, 5.5 millimeters in size, Management of the small pupil, intraoperative management of the small pupil scenario is very easy. So using the Chan cannula and performing the cortical cleaving head dissection, if you see the subincisional iris, there is a tendency for the iris to, to tent up. You know, it doesn't prolapse up, but it tends, it tends up. So again, you know, you need, to, you need to be very careful in this situation. Make sure that hydro dissection is very, very slowly done because you don't want any rapid buildup of intraocular pressure which will, you know, push the iris uh, through the incisions. So again, you know, the iris hook was, uh, the pupillary margin was hooked with the, chan, chan, with the chan cannula. Now, this is important. Uh, it is all, I always fixate the main incision with my tooth forceps. Otherwise, if I just support the globe through the paracentesis incision and try to force my way through into the eye, there is forcible separation of the, the, of the incision, uh, the, the lips, anterior and posterior lip, and there is a possibility of an iris prolapse. So that can be avoided by this maneuver. So I, d I made a deep scalp and then went for uh, chopping. I didn't go for a direct chopping here. And uh, it was, uh, fortunately for me, it was a, a brittle uh, nucleus, so chopping was not uh, very uh, difficult. Uh, you, one has to be careful about the fluid, fluidics in this situation. Make sure that when irrigation uh, 
stream that comes out of your Feco handpiece does not impede, does not hit the pupillary margin or go behind the pupil to to stimulate the, the, the muscles. And likewise, you don't I don't want to be working with a very high vacuum or a bottle height, what the machine, depending upon the machine that you're using. The flow also should not should be under reasonable limits. And it makes sense to inject a dispersive OVD in the peripheral areas where you know, the incisions have been created. So unfortunately, unfortunately for me, the bottle got height, got over. So I would like to complete the case uh, with just one single uh, you know, motion, with entry into the anterior chamber. So in this case, I had to come out and then again injected OVD. And the, you see iris tendon, uh, prolapse, tendon, tendency for iris prolapse in this side, in, in the sub-incision area to the main incision. And as one of the speakers already mentioned, never ever try to push the iris back through the you know, main incision. Always, always go to the side port. Use a cyclodialysis spatula or use a Sinsky hook. Uh, so you don't want to be traumatizing the iris and making the iris more floppy in the process. So again, a dispersive OVD goes, you know, I'll ensuring that you know, the iris is pushed down. There's adequate space for my FACO handpiece to go in into the anterior chamber right now. And again, I am, uh, you know, uh, the bottle has been changed. And I am again fixating the globe with my tooth forceps. And then so that there is no undue pressure on the eye, on the globe, re reducing, uh, increasing the intraocular pressure and uh, predisposing for iris prolapse. So subsequently, you know, the nucleus management goes on well. Uh, it is usually easier to manage nucleus uh, through small pupils uh, scenarios. But when it comes to, you know, cortex management, because, you know, it was, uh, we had performed a, Cortical cleaving had a dissection, but unfortunately, the patient still had a big, la thick layer of uh, you know uh, cortical material uh, in front of the capsule. Uh, so that has that has to be carefully maneuvered. Now, make sure that you don't leave behind even a small chunk of the nucleus, because when the pupil has come down and when there is arcus analysis, as you see what I'm doing here, I ensure that all the tiny bits of nucleus from the sub-institutional area under the main incision or under the paracentesis are brought uh, to the FACO tip and then phacomulsified. This is the last tip, uh, last uh, chip of the nucleus that is taken out. Okay, now the nucleus has become, uh, the, the pupil has come down farther. I'm, I'm using a bimineral irrigation aspiration here, so the superior paracentesis is, is enlarged. At this juncture, if one feels that one needs to use a pupillary device, an iris hook or, or a ring device, one could definitely go ahead with it. Uh, there is, I mean, uh, so there is no way of trying to prove something that you can manage without a device. But in this particular case, uh, I have been a FACO surgeon for more than three decades now. I thought I'll be able to manage uh, uh, cortex removal in a reasonable manner, and uh, that was done. So if you're engaging an iris hook or a pupillary device at this juncture, make sure that uh, the, the device does not hook around the rexis margin. Sometimes and it may happen inadvertently. So inject a good amount of OVD, so creating a space between the pupillary margin and the anterior capsule, and then use the, engage the pupillary devices. So that way the cortex removal was more or less uh, successfully done, as you see here. Now this is interesting. Now AC has become slightly shallow, patient has become a little uncooperative. It is hydrophilic acrylic, I will going into the eye. And I was so close to the tree that I lost the forest. You know, the lens came out flipped. Fortunately for me, this particular lens is an equi-biconvex intraocular lens, equal curvature anteriorly, posteriorly, zero degree angulation. Only thing that uh, is undesirable here is the posterior polished edge, semi-polished edge, because it's a hydrophilic, so hydrophilic acrylic, it is anteriorly located. So there is a possibility that there will be an earlier onset of posterior capsular opacification. I, didn't, I decided not to flip the lens back because you know, it is zero degree angulation. I was not really worried about the IL power issues. So push the lens uh, into the capsular bag, and this is the end of the surgery. And the uh, patient has done pretty well. Good uh, stromal hydration was done. If you feel that you need to do a lot of stromal hydration, uh, it is better to put a suture, main incision, or sometimes even the side port. In this case, of course, it was not necessary. So this is uh, the end of the beginning of the surgery, end of the surgery on day one. A little more SKs than I normally see in my patients, but uh, you know we had to accept it, and. Uh, and you know, the patient had a one-week post-operative vision of 6-6 without correction, and she went, he, went, he continues to do well. Now, if I have a situation where you know, I'm, I'm expecting severe IFIS, for example, in the failure, I had a bad experience, or if the pupil is small to start with, very small, 
and there is a lot of comorbidity, intumescent cataract, heart cataract, shallow AC, not, not a very good, not a very healthy cornea. I'll straight away go for a pupillary device to engage the pupil. Now, this is another case. Again, this was an IFIS, so I have decided to use iris hook for IFIS candidate. So I've decided to use iris hook. My incisions are pretty, pretty well, you know. I've used four hooks. Uh, some people use five hooks. From time to time, I also use five hooks, pentagonal appearance of the pupil. But here, uh, sub incision, though my incision is pretty good and it's pretty long into the cornea, uh, I am finding it difficult to enter into the anterior chamber. So I thought maybe it was a different, different handpiece. It requires a three, three millimeter incision. Uh, Dr. Arif, can you sum up? Please? Yeah, uh, just a sec, uh, just a minute. And then, so I, what I did was now I created another entry into the anterior chamber from little behind using my iris hook. Uh, and using iris hook, I just uh, pulled the iris, kept the iris out of harm's way. And subsequently, the surgery went pretty well. And uh, so this is one of the maneuvers uh, that you could resort to when you have interoperative iris prolapse. So friends, uh, you must be able to detect the cases uh, properly and have an etiological classification so that you, know, you, you are able to make a proper strategy. Pharmacological modulation in mild to moderate cases and uh, in a very severe cases where you expect a lot of uh, issue, interoperative issues, no, one should use a device. And the surgery has to be performed very carefully. Uh, following the guidelines I have just discussed in my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Arup, sir. I think there are many take-home points from your lecture. Thank you for sharing the tips. Low bottle height, dispersive OVD, and watch out for the fluid which is going under the iris to cause iris blowing. So now we have uh, our next speaker, the chief instructor of the course, Dr. Suvain Bhattacharji, and of course he's going to speak on his uh, innovation, the BHEX ring. Over to you, Dr. Suvain. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here in the morning. And I'll speak on uh, BHEX people expand the tricks, trips, and. Uh